When Horace Greeley said, go west, young man, he didn't have the Washington Redskins in mind. Touted as one of the top teams in the NFC East, the Redskins came west to San Francisco and were manhandled by an aggressive 49er defense that sacked Sonny Jurgensen six times. When Jurgensen was able to get his passes off, he met with a similar fate. Jurgensen and number 12 John Brody are two of the finest pure passers in football. In his 14th year as a pro, Brody had one of his best days, completing 17 of 20. Young Gene Washington, number 18, caught seven passes, many of which the frustrated Washington defenders could not believe. The 49ers' first quarter drive was capped by number 42, Doug Cunningham's touchdown burst. But Washington was quick to retaliate on a scorching 75-yard gallop by number 43, Larry Brown. Brown is rapidly becoming known as one of the best young runners in the NFL. But in the second quarter, he was not so lucky. Brown fumbled a pitch out and was down in his own end zone for a safety to give the 49ers a 9-7 lead. San Francisco displayed more of their young talent in rookie John Eisenbarger, number 17. Eisenbarger carried the ball only once during the game but it was good for 27 yards and set up Kenny Willard's touchdown burst. San Francisco's final touchdown came when number 88 Dick Witcher snared a John Brody pass to give the 49ers a 23-10 lead. The Redskins staged a gallant comeback attempt on the strength of Sonny Jurgensen's right arm, but his touchdown pass to Jerry Smith was not enough. The rumblings heard in the vicinity of Kizar Stadium last week were not caused by an earthquake, but rather they were caused by a vastly improved San Francisco team that left the Cleveland Browns with the impression they'd been involved in an upheaval. The 49er offense, led by number 12, quarterback John Brody, and number 40, Ken Willard, was superb. But the Browns were not hapless victims. Number 44, Leroy Kelly, was as dangerous as always. Kelly's running set up a touchdown by number 35, Bo Scott, which tied the game at seven. The 49ers came right back to take the lead on a quarterback's nightmare. An interception and touchdown by number 32, Mel Phillips. Then it was John Brody again on a beautiful pass to number 24, Jimmy Thomas, that increased the San Francisco lead to 21-10. However, the seesaw began to tilt the other way as quarterback Bill Nelson, number 16, arched a bomb to wide receiver Fair Hooker, number 43. And 
And after watching this second-year man perform, who could blame the Cleveland fans if some of them are saying, Paul who? But no one was asking Leroy who, as number 44 burst through right guard for the touchdown that put Cleveland ahead 24-21. A year ago at this time, the 49ers might have rolled over and played dead. Instead, Ken Willard rolled over and the 49ers were on top again. The game began to take on the aspects of a ping pong match as Cleveland stormed back. Nelson hit fair hooker on this play, but was himself injured and forced to leave the game. Reserve quarterback Don Goff, number 11, came in, handed off nicely to Kelly, and with time fleeting, the Browns led again. But this may be the year San Francisco doesn't fold under that type of pressure. John Brody proved it as he put one right on the money, and Jimmy Thomas began the post-game victory celebration as the 49ers outlasted the Browns 34-31. Future opponents should beware the rumblings in San Francisco. Paul himself became cannon fodder for the 49ers when he fumbled away another Falcon opportunity. The 49ers, too, started out by moving the ball well in the strong running of number 42, Doug Cunningham. But quarterback John Brody was not up to his league-leading passing prowess in the first quarter. Early in the quarter, he got a break when number 66 John Small intercepted, then fumbled away and attempted Brody pass. Throughout the period, it was evident that Brody, a scratch golfer, was not up to par on the gridiron. Much of Brody's trouble, however, was coming from the Falcon defense. Led by number 87, Claude Humphrey, the 49ers could muster only one first down until the final play of the quarter. On the last play of the period, the 49ers finally struck gold. Brody let fly a perfect pass to rookie receiver Preston Riley for his first completion of the game. 68 yards to the Falcon 21. On a replay, we can see that once he caught the ball, Riley quickly lost his defender. He was helped by a block from Gene Washington, and only the speed of cornerback Ken Reeves saved a touchdown as the quarter ended. Brody then came right back to Riley for another first down at the Falcons' nine to open the second quarter. From here, it took setback Ken Willard three plays to score. On third down from the three, Willard swept left and hit pay dirt. On a replay of the score, watch left guard Randy Beisler, number 65, clear Willard's path. Though outplayed so far, the 49ers led 7-0. Passing attack. John Brody, the leading passer in the league, had completed only three in the entire first half. Bill Tucker's 29-yard kickoff return gave the 49ers good field position on the 38. The men from the Golden Gate started with a ground game that was almost non-existent in the first half. So when the Falcons stacked up Doug Cunningham for no gain, Brody went to the air and stayed there. He hit Gene Washington on the flat for 12 yards, then went to his big tight end Bob Windsor over the middle for 16 and a first down on the Atlanta 21. The Falcons were reeling now, and Brody wisely stayed with the pass. He found Washington again on the square out pattern, and San Francisco was at the Falcon goal. On the two, Brody rolled right and Windsor made a nice catch just in bounds for the score. For the first time, the 49ers looked like the same team that had knocked off the Browns and Redskins. 
replicate San Francisco's scoring drive. But Cannonball Butler fumbled when hit by Charlie Kruger, and Tommy Hart fell on the ball to end the threat. The 49ers had the break they had been looking for and were now determined to exploit it. Ken Willard, who had been completely stopped in the first half, was sent pounding into Atlanta's line for sizable gains. Brody really had his team in high gear now as he mixed the power thrusts of Ken Willard with the short passes that are his trademark. This is the year John Brody is determined to disprove the theory that he is strictly a hot and cold passer. The first two games of the season were outstanding ones for the 14-year veteran. He was named back of the week for his performance against Washington and brought his team from behind to beat the powerful Browns in the season's second game. The 49ers' momentum came to an abrupt halt on the Atlanta 19, however. First, reliable Doug Cunningham just barely missed a looping pass. Then a Brody bullet was deflected in the end zone by Ken Reeves. A repeat of this play shows that Brody was under some pressure just as he unloaded, but it still took a fine play in the secondary to save the touchdown for Atlanta. Bruce Gossett kicked a field goal from the 27 to put the 49ers even further out in front, 17-7. Gossett was the third leading scorer in the NFL last season and is an important addition to this improved San Francisco team. Rookie place kicker Ken Vineyard kicked to the 49er 5 and Bill Tucker almost brought it right back. His return was good for 43 yards. Again, their specialty teams had given San Francisco excellent field position. Brody seemed content to stay on the ground with Doug Cunningham doing most of the running. On a third and five situation at the Atlanta 35, he passed to Tucker, who was tackled one yard short of the first down. So Bruce Gossett was called upon, and he delivered from the 43-yard line. San Francisco now led 20-14. Atlanta couldn't seem to stop the 49er offense. Ham swung wide left, found some running room, but fumbled when hit. The ball bounced perfectly to number 20, safety Tom McCauley, and he raced 42 yards with the gift. John Brody himself made the tackle at the San Francisco 13. This unusual play deserves another look. Cunningham, with a full head of steam, was hit simultaneously low and high. This caused the fumble, and McCauley had clear sailing down the right sideline until pinched in by Brody. Rookie running back Sonny Campbell got the call twice to move the ball to the seven. Then Barry on third down had the ball batted at the line and almost intercepted. Fourth down, Atlanta decided to go for the touchdown. Barry threw his third scoring pass of the game to Gail Cogdell, who made a great catch for the score that put Atlanta in the lead for the first time today. No one knew it better than the old pro John Brody. After Tucker took the kickoff out to the 27, Brody led a slow but steady march upfield. He mixed his plays beautifully. Cunningham in the middle, Willard through the right, the short hitch pass to Washington. Always the thrusts were short, deliberate, and cool. When a pass to number 85, rookie Preston Riley was overthrown in the flat, Brody came right back with the same play and made it work. What always worked, though, was Ken Willard. The fourth-ranked runner in the conference ran for 90 yards today. San Francisco was moving closer. Brody swung a pass to Cunningham, who managed to get out of bounds. Closer still. With only six seconds left in the game, Bruce Gossett trotted out to do his specialty for the third time today. 
There are those who maintain that the short field goal has become almost automatic. But Bruce Gossett's chip shot from the 19 was no good. And what appeared to be a certain third straight 49er victory had become a disheartening defeat. In Los Angeles, Dick Nolan and the 49ers faced the unbeaten Rams with an infamous tradition. In 20 years of NFL play, San Francisco has yet to win a divisional title. John Brody was off to a fast start, having completed 67% of his passes. But many other optimistic San Francisco openings had been crushed on the floor of the L.A. Coliseum. The awesome Rams burst onto the field with the momentum of six straight preseason victories and three consecutive league wins. History was with Los Angeles, but the 49ers were determined to change their annual role. The usually untouchable Ram, Roman Gabriel, repeatedly felt the sincerity of San Francisco intentions. He was buffeted into his first interception of the season as number 53, Tommy Hart, gathered in the ball but made the mistake of tripping over Gabriel. Hart was called back, but his optimism mirrored a new confidence which the young 49ers feel this season. When Gabriel's passes did find their way past the line of scrimmage, 49er defensive backs took up the assault. Gabriel completed only 40% of his passes for his lowest total yardage of the season. The Rams' last bid was turned back by number 52, Skip Vanderbunt, and the potent Los Angeles powerhouse was limited to a game total of two field goals. While 77,000 Ram fans watched in disbelief at what was happening to their offense, old pro John Brody was doing something even more unbelievable to the fierce Ram defenders. With his offensive line protecting him flawlessly from the legendary Ram rush, Brody set up and methodically peppered the Rams with middle distance passes as he controlled the ball and the game. Six times, Brody hit number 18, Gene Washington, in front of the 49er secondary. All six set up the seventh. Washington cantered in gleefully as the 49ers surprisingly matched strengths with the Rams and came up a winner. For Los Angeles, however, the cruelest blow of all occurred in the first half. Brody resurrected a relic of the sand lots and loped 12 yards for the score on a quarterback draw. For once, fate seems to be smiling on the 49ers, and after two decades of frustration, San Francisco may be on the right track at last. Bill Kilmer opposed his former teammates as the Saints battled the San Francisco 49ers, who were tied with the Rams and had the NFL's leading passer, John Brody. San Francisco's specialty teams gave the 49ers excellent field position in the first half as number 24, Jim Thomas, sped 55 yards with a kickoff. But the 49ers squandered this opportunity and after Bruce Taylor went 51 yards with a punt, to set up a field goal, the 49ers had only three points to show for their efforts. Then a mistake by the 49ers specialty team as Steve Spurrier was tackled by Doug Wyatt, number 23, before he could punt. This set up Tom Dempsey's second field goal in a 6-3 New Orleans lead at halftime. In the second half, the 49ers showed the spark they had the previous week in the great win over Los Angeles, as John Brody speared Gene Washington for a 46-yard hookup and a 10-6 lead. They added to that when a Rosie Taylor interception of an Ed Hargett pass Set up a 48-yard field goal by Bruce Gossett.
The Saints came right back, though, as Hugh Hollis, number 18, intercepted a John Brody pass. And Billy Kilmer hit Dan Abramowitz with a tying touchdown. But this is a new year in San Francisco, and the 49ers prove that by recapturing the lead immediately. First, number 17, John Eisenbarger romped 49 yards with a screen pass. And then Washington caught his second touchdown pass with a diving effort in the end zone. San Francisco 20, New Orleans 13. With less than two minutes to go, Saints fans who had traveled to San Francisco expressed their desires and were rewarded when ex-49er Kilmer combined with ex-49er Dave Parks for a 2020 tie to knock their ex-teammates out of first place in the NFC's West. Two of pro football's high-flying Cinderella teams met in San Francisco's Kizar Stadium. 49er quarterback John Brody has been warming up for a championship for 14 years. And even though they've been close on occasion, they've never won as much as a division title. But coach Dick Nolan, now in his third year, has the 49ers believing their time is near. The Denver Broncos have never even had a winning season. But Lou Saban has whipped the Broncos into a winner. And they seem to be feeling the same things as the 49ers. One thing that has helped the Broncos is the discovery of a running attack. Willis Crenshaw, number 33, acquired from the Cardinals, gives Denver another quality back to pair with superstar Floyd Little, number 44. Floyd has been Denver's most lethal weapon for three years. The 49ers found out how lethal in the first quarter when he sped 80 yards for a touchdown that gave Denver the lead 7-3. Another facet of Denver's improvement is the defense a leading unit against the run, and an improving one against the pass. While the 49ers were notating Denver's improvement, the Broncos scored another touchdown. This time on a pass from Pete Lisk to Crenshaw, and Denver led at the half 14-6. But Brody and the 49ers have been waiting too long for the opportunity before them. And on the fifth play of the second half, John Eisenbarger raced 61 yards for a touchdown. And the 49ers were ready to tee off. San Francisco's secondary began picking off passes with regularity. Mel Phillips' interception set up the go-ahead field goal. And Gene Washington, number 18, sprung loose to set up another as the 49ers began to wear down the youthful Broncos. But the gutsy Broncos were in it until the very end. And with five seconds left, we're on San Francisco's 20-yard line. However, Pete Lisk's desperation heave was intercepted by number 52, Skip Vanderbunt.
The 49ers have been waiting for a long time, and they finally seem to have the talent and the spirit to ensure their share of victory. The 49ers could run a long way in 1970. There was better weather in San Francisco for Game 7, but Bart Starr didn't have much chance to enjoy it. Rookie defensive star Bruce Taylor, number 44, set the tone of the game as he returned one of the three 49er interceptions to set up the game's first four. John Brody added another scoring pass to Bob Windsor, and the 49ers held the half-game lead over the Rams. Week number eight found the 49ers facing Dick Butkus and the Bears. John Brody threw three more touchdown passes, two to Gene Washington, as Brody became only the fourth player ever to complete 2,000 passes. 49ers, 37, Bears, 16. In the Astrodome, the Houston Oilers, with nothing to lose, entertain the San Francisco 49ers with everything to win. And for a while, it appeared that Houston could be a spoiler. Leroy Mitchell interrupted this Brody to Ken Willard aerial effort, and shortly thereafter, Roy Hopkins plugged it in for six. Houston safety Ken Houston brought down the high and mighty once again with this interception. With a little razzle your dazzle help from his friends and a little help from the 49ers, Charlie Johnson brought the Oilers close. Hopkins wheeled in for six more points. But the game turned in the 49ers' favor when number 27, Al Randolph, spiked Jones' punt and the ball rolled out of the end zone for a safety. John Brody got together with Jimmy Thomas for San Francisco's first touchdown. For his next act, the veteran Brody went prospecting with Dick Witcher, striking pay dirt once again, and Houston's secondary began to falter under the whip arm of the hottest quarterback in pro football. Brody's third touchdown pass of the day went to Gene Washington. And when Ken Willard powered in from the three, the game was safely salted away. San Francisco, leaders in the NFC West, 30, Houston. Week 12 saw Kizar Stadium's last regular season pro game and the Brody to Washington combination took the old fortress out in style. Scoring one and setting up two come from behind plunges by Ken Willard as the 49ers avenge their earlier loss to the Falcons. Last week, the San Francisco 49ers traveled to New Orleans where they met the troublesome Saints. It was an important game for the 49ers and they started out as though they had a case of the big game jitters. Number 18, Gene Washington, dropped this sure touchdown, but it was the last time that happened all afternoon. Quarterback John Brody showed that he had confidence in his fine young receiver and went right back to him to make it 7-0. But the Saints were loose, and in a game that meant little to them, they scrambled and gambled and won the gamble on a 46-yarder to number 46, Dan Abramowitz.
Then number 17, quarterback Billy Kilmer, came right back and hit a flying Al Dodd to put New Orleans ahead 14-7. Brody countered by throwing to running back Ken Willard, number 40. But when Willard failed to take it in on two attempts from the one, Brody was forced to go to his quick runners. And although his running game looked good, Brody had an even more surefire method. Gene Washington has come a long way in a short time. In only his second year, he seems headed for superstardom. But even more than that, he's the kind of receiver that John Brody can go to in any situation. And so it was that a balding quarterback and a highballing receiver made last Sunday less than heavenly for the Saints. And even a last-ditch rally on a Kilmer to Abramowitz pass was wasted. Because no sooner were the Saints driving to get back in the game when a missed field goal by Tom Dempsey was fielded by Bruce Taylor, number 44, who streamed 92 yards to wrap it up for the 49ers, 38-27. And the 49er victory, coupled with the Rams' loss to Detroit last Monday, left San Francisco alone at the top in the NFC West. In Oakland, fans paid pregame homage to the unlikely hero of an improbable season. George Blanda, middle-aged America's patron saint, had routinely pulled off miracles and his team had already clinched a playoff berth. And now they had to settle the Battle of the Bay. It looked as though Blanda might not be needed at all when Daryl LaMonica, number three, took after San Francisco in typical Raider style. Number 87, rookie sensation Raymond Chester strolled in to give Oakland a quick lead. Then the Raider defense took to task that prolific 49er battery. John Brody to Gene Washington. San Francisco's entire season was at stake, but Brody spent most of the confused early going in close examination of the Oakland Coliseum turf. The first quarter was Oakland's and soon they were driving for another score. Number 25, Rosie Taylor accepted the 49er good fortune and suddenly even the proven points of the Oakland attack began to misfire. Proven points like the bomb to number 81, Warren Wells. Everyone had trouble staying upright, but Bruce Taylor's interception picked up the faint San Francisco pulse and Brody suddenly remembered that he was the NFC's leading passer. He lofted a neat floater to number 82, Ted Qualick, and the team which had quietly folded away so often in the past began to pick up steam. And now LaMonica could not even be sure of a sure thing. His pass started out in the hands of Chester and ended up in the possession of number 37, Jimmy Johnson. Brody now knows that Gene Washington cannot be stopped by any secondary for an entire game. Washington had only two receptions for the day, but one was for 34 yards and six points. In a sudden six-minute stretch, the 49ers had sprinted to a 17-point lead, and Raider fans figured it was high time to let George do it. On four consecutive completions into 49er territory, George did it. 
but on the fifth, it undid him. Number 64, Dave Wilcox, saved San Francisco from another miracle, and Blanda returned to the ranks of mortality. Exit La Monica, exit Blanda, enter the snake. But rookie Ken Snake Stabler found that the goal-rushing 49ers were not to be denied. They forced Stabler into the ninth Raider turnover, and after a quarter of a century of bitter disappointment, San Francisco had its first divisional title. The joy was brief. Dick Nolan must test his title against the Vikings up in Minnesota. The 38-7 defeat left Oakland's fortunes droopy. But the Raiders have a week to get themselves back together for the playoffs, and who knows, perhaps another Battle of the Bay will take place next month in Miami. From the 49er 9, however, watch number 57, middle linebacker Frank Nunley, key on Clint Jones and stop him cold as the 49ers began to negate Minnesota's offensive strength. So Quazzo sent Jones out of the backfield on a short flare, but the results were disastrous. Linebacker Jim Snydecki's interception was the first break of the game in what many thought would be an error-free contest. But many were wrong as Ken Willard fumbled on the 49ers second play from scrimmage. Safety Paul Krause picked it up and took it in. The mighty Vikings defense had once again been their best offense and had given them a seven to nothing pad to work on early. Soda. Having set up the Vikings secondary perfectly with short passes, Rhodey went for Gene Washington deep and hit him. But the stylish second year receiver fumbled and again Minnesota's defense had come up with a big play to stifle San Francisco. Edric Hardman, number 86, break down his block and sack Quazzo, forcing a punting situation. And from our end zone camera, watch the wall of 49er blockers on the punt. Then watch rookie Bruce Taylor, number 44, as he moves through this alley 30 yards to the Viking 23 aided by a key block from number 82, Ted Qualick. Two plays later, John Brody spotted Dick Witcher all alone in the end zone, and San Francisco had tied the score in a flash. Three times in the half, twice on this series. The second, recovered by the 49ers' Stan Heinemann, set up San Francisco's last score of the half, a 40-yard field goal from the right leg of Bruce Gossett to make it 10-7, San Francisco. This is so far today, gave no reason for optimism. Quazzo, with good protection, went for the bomb far upfield to Gene Washington, but it was overthrown and almost intercepted by Jimmy Johnson. On third down, the Viking quarterback threw a bullet to Jim Lindsay in the clear, but it was dropped. Minnesota had failed to improve their field position again. On fourth down, Tom McNeil had to punt from deep inside his end zone. The kick was good enough, but Rookie of the Year candidate Bruce Taylor burned the Vikings again. His 23-yard return gave his team the ball at the Minnesota 14. If the Vikings have a weakness, it is their specialty teams. Opponents return three kickoffs and one punt for touchdowns against them this season. And Taylor, the NFC's leading punt returnee, was just the man to further exploit the weakness. Ken Willard, who would lead all rushers today, slammed his way to the one-yard line, and San Francisco had a first and goal at the one, with less than three minutes left. Two plays later, the NFL's leading quarterback followed his center over the goal line for the cherished score. His team was in front, 17 to seven, and there was only a minute, 20 seconds to go.
Minnesota got its score as Gene Washington made a fine play in the end zone, shielding Bruce Taylor away from the ball. His touchdown catch brought the Vikings to within three points of the 49ers, but there was only one second remaining. Minnesota's impossible dream ended when Fred Cox's onside kick was covered by rookie Bob Hoskins. The Cinderella 49ers had overcome their own adversity to beat the mighty Minnesota Vikings. The Norsemen, who had won 14 consecutive games at Metropolitan Stadium, fled from the scene of the crime. Their chances at revenge for last year's Super Bowl defeat were shattered. This is Cunningham. And he's out across the 35 to about the 36 or 7, where he is met by Charlie Waters and Bob Lilly. This is Willard. First down. 49-yard line. The fake was to Willard. The pass is for Washington. He's at the 9-yard line. Gossett. 21 field goals has just hit another one on the board and they lead by three to nothing we'll be back with san francisco's kickoff in just a moment this is tight end bob windsor and he has a first down at the 45 yard line dave edwards made the tackle all alone is windsor And he has a first down at the 26-yard line. This is Windsor. Touchdown. I said Windsor. I meant Witcher. Witcher for the touchdown. Let's have another look. As Witcher gets open behind Adderley, I believe it is. Now the score is the Cowboys 17, the 49ers 10. The catch is made and a very short gain to the 26. Cunningham tackled immediately by linebacker Chuck Howley. Witcher right. This is a second and seven. This is Qualick, the tight end, and he's close to a first down at the 33. Not this time. Whoa! I don't know whether he made it or not. A tremendous charge by the Dallas defense. Fourth down. The catch is made for the first down by Dick Witcher. Down goes Brody. He held on to the ball somehow, but there's a loss of 10. 24 quarters, I should say, plus. Defending was Jordan. Intended receiver was Qualic. From the San Francisco 25. Gene Washington made the catch. It is not a first down. It'll be fourth and seven from the 38. Incomplete at the 49-yard line. The intended receiver was Kenny Willard. And there is the veteran and great running back. I think he had his hands on it. I know he was hit. It was incomplete. And the Dallas defense has turned the ball over to the offense at the 49er 39-yard line. With two minutes to play, John Brody could only stand and watch as Dallas began to run down the clock. They ran it down to 17 seconds and smartly took a delay of the game penalty, but they couldn't run it out. 
So with five seconds left, John Brody had one last gasp for his team, his town, and his title. He tried valiantly, but time, the Grim Reaper, finally ran out on the San Francisco 49ers who must wait till next year. For the Dallas Cowboys, it was yet another chapter in their storybook climb to glory.